It was in the fall of, of 1942, and my dad had bought a place uh, about a mile south of the town of Norris, the old Sam Hill place it was called. He was a second cousin to my father. And uh, we were moving all these, uh, these uh, furnishings and equipment and cattle and hay and everything else. And when one day in uh, November of 42, I think, uh, my dad said, we've got so much stuff piled up up there. We've, we have so much of our uh, possess so many of our possessions moved to the new location that somebody ought to stay with it. And I was 12 years old at the time, and he put me on the back of a big load of hay that uh, Wiley Cassidy was hauling out for us and said, you, you need to go up there and spend the night and sort of watch after things. People could come and carry off uh, all we had. Well, in the meantime, my uncle and aunt had lived, had moved nearby in a little house, and uh, so I was staying with them. They didn't have any furniture, and so I slept on the floor. But then uh, when I moved out, when I came out from Oak Ridge, from what is now Oak Ridge that day, then Robertsville community, I thought I would be going back the next day. Well, my dad sent word, you know, that I need to stay up out a little longer. So as it happened, uh, that was the last time I saw the old home place and all because uh, they kept moving more and more things in, so I had to stay stay with them. So we went to Glen Alpin School, which is, uh, what, two and a half, three miles from here. And um, then during that time, we were aware of uh, the town of Norris, and my father had started uh, uh, into the dairy, dairy business. Uh, he talked to, I guess, Mr. Crosno, R.G. Crosno, and so he bought cattle, uh, cows, and switched over from stock farming to dairy farming. So we had, a, the, we had this old uh, log barn, and the, we milked by hand, of course. And uh, by the way, I should say, maybe parenthetically, that during the time we lived in what is now Oak Ridge, those six or seven years, we never had electricity. Um, and this will not set well with TVA, perhaps, but it's, it's true. We live within a half a mile of the TVA lines, and we never could get uh, electricity to run over to our, uh, and all the other neighbors, you know, uh, that lived right in that little area there. But when we moved back up here, we did have TVA electricity, but not for milking purposes. We milked in an old log barn, and, and we'd sit there of the morning when it was zero, and the only thing that kept warm when you were milking was your hands, and uh, your feet was, uh, uh, had no way of, of being kept warm at all. But uh, we started bringing the milk to, uh, to Norris Creamery, and um, I remember in the summertime we would have to, uh, we didn't have a cooler, but we uh, cart it, had a little cart, hand-pushed cart, we'd take it down and put it in the spring, and then um, of a morning, we'd go down and push it up the hill in that little cart. And my dad, when we were attending Norris High School, would uh, put us off down at the uh, creamery, and we'd walk on to school. It never occurred to him. I mean, he was saving gasoline, you know, to waste gasoline driving all the way up this hill and back. But uh, the years in Norris High School were very pleasant, um, and I was aware from the beginning, I guess everyone was, that there was a difference between the so-called Norris kids and the county kids. Uh, it wasn't, uh, I guess, I think that there was a, a, a tinge of um, uh, feeling inferior, inferior on both sides. The Norris people felt, I, th I think that they felt that, uh, that we thought that they were better than we were and this kind of thing and the county kids thought that they were being looked down on. And so there's always that little bit of, uh, just like you have in the races of people, you know, even though they're getting along, if you have mixed races, they're always, there's always conscious uh, of the difference and so forth. But it was very good, the fact that you had people from different parts of the country. And um, the four years that I was here, uh, I was, pretty active in uh, other activities, although I didn't have a lot of time to play, no time at all to play basketball. We had to work on the farm of the morning before we milked, and then milked 
Uh, I had about each one of us, my brother David and my father and I all had about six or seven cows each to milk, which took a, quite a while. And uh, so when school was over, we had to get home and put up hay and this kind of thing. And no time to play around with basketball. And stuff. Although I did play a while on the FFA team with, with Robert Weems. But um, I was elected uh, to the student council and then I was elected president of the student body. And I think the, the county kids sort of thought that was pretty neat to have a county boy to be president of the, of the student council, I guess as we called it. John Rice, let me interrupt for a second. Go back and tell me what years it was that you came to Norris High School. You know, what, when you actually, and did you go to Glen Alpine before that? Yeah. It, you know, and, and how was that, the, you know, the kids that came to the school from Glen Alpine versus the kids that, at that time, were the Norris kids going to the high school in elementary school, or was there a separate elementary school at that point? Well, um, in, in 19, uh, we moved from Oak Ridge to uh, our farm here near Norris in 19, in the fall of 1942. And after that, we went to the Glen Alpin School, which is, as I say, three or four miles down the road. Uh, we, I came to, my brother and I were both in the same grade. Uh, we started the school the same year. And so we started here in 1945 in high school. And um, the, the school at the time, as I recall, was uh, included the high school and the elementary students. And it was several years later before the uh, elementary school was built. I remember one day, uh, of course, as you know, Norris High School was unique in many ways. It had uh, uh, supposedly the largest all electrically heated building in the world at the time and had these sophisticated uh, communication system where you could sit in the classroom and talk to the uh, principal or the principal could talk to in individual classes and all. Uh, I think they did away with that because people were maybe abusing it. But uh, yeah, in the, in the very beginning, uh, you had, uh, I guess, grades one through 12. And um, I remember in the, in the lunchroom, uh, I guess the little children ate first. As a matter of fact, I worked in the lunchroom for Vera Hall um, and uh, started washing dishes for my lunch. Didn't have to. My dad would certainly had uh, money and would have, I don't know that he ever even knew that, you know, but uh, then I, she later uh, finally talked me into coming out and running the cash register, I think, during lunch. But uh, those were all very, I guess, typical high school days, those four years. I'll, let's, let's stay with the school for a little while, though. Um, a couple of couple things I want to see if you could explore. One is, you know, what sort of impression did you have when you rolled into this school? From I mean, because obviously this was a new type of experience because you primarily had grown up, you know, in rural East Tennessee, and this was different. And and secondly, the people, the interaction. I mean, if you ended up as the president of your of this of your senior class or whatever it was, or the student body. Obviously, you made significant inroads and friendships and became a part of this larger you know, group of people. And I'd like to <coughs> see if you could explore a little bit of that. And lastly, was there anything really unique? I mean, what can, uh, do you recall any uh, teachers or programs within that school that, you know, um, that maybe we ought to consider doing these days? I mean, you ended up as, as an educator for many years. Well, I, I do remember, of course, uh, several of the uh, teachers that uh, I had in Norris High School. And one was uh, Mary Margaret Emmons, uh, who taught here for so many years. And later on, when I became school superintendent, uh, I hired her as the principal of Norris High School. And I think she was the first woman principal in, uh, uh, in the county, certainly the, the first high school uh, female principal. Uh, she was. She taught math and was uh, and was a person that uh, everybody uh, liked. As a matter of fact, I was talking with my secretary a day or two ago, who's uh, in her late forties, I guess, and she was saying that uh, when Ms. Emmons taught at Clinton High School uh, in the summer, that uh, she thought that Ms. Emmons was the best teacher she ever had. Another teacher was uh, Ms. Emmons passed on several years ago. Uh, a fellow who's still living. 
and came from a background similar to mine down in West Tennessee in Dixon County. His name was Robert Weems, and um, he taught um, agriculture. And I took all uh, four years, I guess, of uh, agriculture and shop and uh, got involved in uh, various activities that, sponsored by, that he sponsored. <clears throat> One was the, the, speech, the speaking contest, which uh, uh, I think uh, it had a great, <clears throat> great influence on me. This is a 4-H program? Um, Future Farmers? Yeah, Future Farmers in high school, I guess 4-H in, in elementary. Uh, and um, so, as I say, I entered a speak, speaking contest and throughout the area. And we took, uh, we had various projects. We would go to Nashville for different things. We went to Chicago. He took us up there once. And he was uh, very uh, much a product of his uh, uh, rural upbringing, didn't believe in wasting a lot of money. And I remember when, when we went to Chicago uh, that uh, we, we drove in his old uh, Mercury, must have been seven or eight of us, uh, and we spent the night uh, near Indianapolis and uh, we, we stayed out in a cornfield, slept on the ground, saving money. And then we went on to Chicago and stayed on State Street in the Chicago and the Stockyard Inn. And uh, Stockyard Inn maybe had some pretty good rooms downstairs, but the whole upstairs was one big room with the vagrants and, and uh, tramps and whomever stayed. And it cost a dollar a night. And uh, you had to take your belongings out and your billfold and so forth and tie, it all, tie them all up in, your, in the pillowcase and then sleep on the pillowcase and make sure you had them the next morning. But uh, Robert Weems, was, uh, uh, he taught a lot more than just uh, the techniques of agriculture and all. Uh, he's still living and, and after, he, after the, he left here, he went into Knoxville and started in the house building business and became he was president of Knoxville Builders Association and built a lot of uh, areas, West Weems Road and North Weems Road and all this. Um, so the, um, no, I think the fact that uh, you had uh, the, 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 the Norris students, the sons and daughters of TVA people and all, um, and, and the others, I think it was uh, helpful to both to both groups. Well, I, I guess I was, uh, after I went to join the Army for, during the Korean War, never went to Korea, but uh, was in the infantry and went, I uh, spent a lot of time in Europe, and came back and I had, for some reason, decided I wanted to go into the Foreign Service, but in the meantime, I was going to um, teach uh, a year to uh, make enough uh, money to get enrolled. So I, I got a job teaching in Norris High School and, and uh, ended up staying here for five years. And uh, the first year was the most difficult because uh, I'm interested now in hearing all the problems that the teachers say that they have. Uh, I, I had uh, six different classes, six preparations. And uh, the first class I had was, uh, was English. Um, and uh, it was in, they were in a cramped little room, just uh, as many kids as you could get in there. And the second uh, class, and I probably won't remember all of them, but the second was taught of all places in the gymnasium. And uh, in the front of the gymnasium, it was seventh grade class, and they, the, most of them were bright students. So uh, during the time I was teaching that seventh grade, in the front of the auditorium, in the front of the gymnasium, the, the back of it was uh, used as a walkway for people going from one class to another and teachers and so forth. And uh, there was 41 or 42 students and they were very difficult to, difficult to control. And uh, I learned a lot. If I had had all the, the good conditions that one uh, would wish, I would never have learned these things. So, uh, while I was looking over here, somebody would be talking over here. And uh, I not only have to have uh, quietness uh, when I'm talking, you know, you know, but I also have to have them listening. I mean, if they're just daydreaming, that, that's distracted to them. 
So one of the things that I came up with a little innovative idea, and I, I just fell upon this idea because I always like to know where people are from and where, what kind of a name. Uh, is it uh, Danish or is it uh, Scottish, Welsh or whatever? Well, I found the students were just absolutely fascinated with this. What kind of a name is Jones? You know, uh, and you know, we'd say, well, Jones is probably strictly Welsh name and so forth. What is Snodderly? Snodderly, you got to be German. How come I'm German? So what I said, I decided that we'd have, uh, we'd write our life story, each one, and the first chapter would be your grandparents or your great aunts and uncles, and they went out and they would talk with them and and they would write that and come back and I would grade the paper for grammar, what little grammar I knew. And um, so then the second chapter, then we would, we'd have to read it in class and they were just absolutely spellbound. The second chapter was their parents, talk to your parents, where were they from, how did they get married, where did they first meet? And this was the first time that they had ever sat down and talked with their grandparents or their parents about things of that sort. And the third chapter was <clears throat> their first, uh, where they were born <clears throat> in the first four years and, and this kind of thing. And we went on through like this. So then every chapter was, I read it, sent it back and forth and until they uh, finished and then they bound it and they had their, the life story of uh, Billy Parham uh, or whomever. Well, that's the second class I had. And then the third one, uh, was geography, I believe, and then I, I taught a class in uh, senior um, in American history. And then, in addition to that, they gave me the job of being of sponsoring the annual, about which I knew nothing. And then they gave me the job of sponsoring the senior class. So with uh, with six different preparations uh, and uh, these other activities, uh, I almost quit because. I'm accustomed to, to working hard and so forth, but I told uh, my wife Elizabeth that I, that I wish I'd never, at one point, I'd never started because, and I read these papers. I mean, every class I had, I went home and I read them all and, and corrected them, sent them back. But it got a little easier as time went on. Um, and then after teaching here, what led you away? What beckoned in another direction? Well, I um, decided that, uh, you know, they, there's, uh, if you're in the teaching profession, there's only uh, two ways that you, uh, maybe three ways you can advance. And one is to uh, leave the profession, you know. And, and there's very few really good teachers, and I'm not saying that I was, but there's very few really good uh, aggressive, ambitious teachers that stay in the classroom from the time they start until they retire because they, there's not any remuneration and if you've got a family and so forth, it's difficult to do. The other way, I guess, would be to, uh, to um, get into administration and that's really what I decided maybe I would would do, so I became principal of a little school called Melbourne, and ran for the uh, county. At the time, it's called the county court, same as county commission now. And I was uh, very young, and um, there was four main precincts: Andersonville, Fairview, Glen Alpin, and Norris. Well, um, there was a dozen people running for that terribly important job because. Uh, you, it, it controls the purse strings of the entire county. You hire the school board at the time, you hired the school board members, you appoint any vacancies. But just the fact that you control all the money for every uh, office in the county makes it extremely important. Then the, you could uh, marry people and uh, you could write warrants and all this kind of thing back then. It was sort of a, really was a justice uh, in, of a sort. So I went out to, um, to the Melbourne uh, as principal and stayed there for one year. And it was like going back in time. They had um, uh, stoves for heat. And uh, I, at the time, I was not only principal of the school, I taught the seventh grade, I taught the eighth grade, uh, I coached 
of all things. I coached the, the, both the girls and boys basketball team. I was manager of lunchroom, had the lunchroom, had to fill out all those reports. And I guess we don't need to get in this, but at the time I was teaching uh, almost half time at the University of Tennessee and was starting, started the Mem Norris Memorial Gardens about that time, uh, a small corporation which is uh, still here, there. And so I was uh, quite busy then. Uh, I was on <clears throat> the county court for two or three years. And in that capacity, you know, we, we dealt with the schools a lot. Then um, I don't really know wh where I got the idea of uh, running. Uh, I guess the next step was that, uh, that I became principal of Lake City, which was uh, Lake City Elementary, the largest elementary school in the county. And uh, someone asked me, old Dr. Scott, if I'd like to be, uh, he was on the uh, county commission, and he said, would you like to be principal of uh, Lake City Elementary? He said, we'd like to have you up there. Then Mr. Tuttle is re retiring, and I said, well, I understand that a friend of mine is sort of in line for that job, and I don't want to jump in front of him, a uh, former schoolmate. And he said, no, he said, he's not going to get the job. He said, if you want it, uh, we'll work it out. That's the way it worked back then. It was, if somebody had a lot of influence, he could talk to the superintendent and so forth. So I became super, uh, principal of Lake City Elementary, the 26 teachers, and I was younger than any of the, of the 26 teachers, but it got along really, really well. Where were you living? I was um, living at, when I was uh, teaching at Norris High School, I was living at, uh, between Oak Ridge and Clinton in a new subdivision in it called Decora Hills. And, uh, but about the time that I'm talking about, or when, I'm, when I ran, when I was principal over at Melbourne, uh, I bought a, a little uh, flat top down here on the Highway 61, which joins the city of Norris, and which um, uh, is, uh, at one time, was, was in the city limits. So um, after I stayed in uh, Lake City, this would have been in 1960, uh, the, um, the a lot of talk about the school superintendency and so forth, and and I had no inclination or no ambition whatsoever to, to go to become superintendent because I was not I was still in my twenties I guess at the time, and superintendents are supposed to be uh, middle aged or old and uh, sophisticated uh, looking and all this you know, and so I was still. Uh, you know, just f fresh from the country. And um, I uh, did run, and uh, was first time I was elected, then they found out that I uh, couldn't get a, a certificate. And then they put the election off for a while, and in the meantime, I went over to the university and got, a, got more, uh, got about 45 hours above the master's degree. While I was teaching, I'm jumping back a little bit in Norris High School, I got a a degree in uh, master's degree in international law of all things, and uh, later on, uh, uh, I, I guess I was just interested in in that uh, phase, but and not because it had any uh, applicability to anything I was doing or anything I was going to do. But it, while I was uh, superintendent, and there again, it seemed like a lifetime—seven years—we. Um, tried to start a lot of, uh, of new programs. We had one of the first uh, Head Start, one of the third, uh, I think, uh, Head Start programs in the state. We had a lot of uh, what we call, then was called the Neighborhood Youth Corps. And I liked that because it put boys out to, to working, doing landscaping and uh, this kind of thing, and where they could uh, not only learn what to do something productive, they could have a feeling of accomplishment, and also it was doing, getting things done that needed to be done. I never could understand uh, most of the schools back then, uh, you could go up to them and it was just one big clay bank. Not one shrub, no flowers, nothing aesthetically pleasing about it at all. Same thing inside a lot of classrooms. A lot of teachers did wonderful things inside the classroom. Others did nothing. You look at some of the pictures of the old classrooms, it's one big, uh, one big blank wall. 
But uh, I always thought that uh, if you're uh, uh, learning, it depends on your state of mind. And uh, the more pleasant surrounding that you have, the more that you can learn. I don't believe in air conditioning to this day very much, but I did believe in it in schools because if you go out at recess and play ball and they come in and they're red faced and sweat pouring off of them and the humidity, you can see it rising. Nobody's going to just well turn them out and let them go back and play some more, you know, because they're not going to learn anything. But uh, at any rate, uh, those seven years were very uh, trying and uh, we had, uh, at the time I was first elected, I was uh, the commissioner said the youngest school superintendent in the state and, and he could have also gone on and said the, the least experienced and, and capable I guess because I had no, no, no experience at all of filling out all these state forms and all the, the, the uh, bureaucracy that's involved. Wasn't so much back then but we did have a lot of federal programs, state programs. And all. Well without thinking about it for very long, I would have, I probably would say uh, consolidation. Not only was it, uh, I thought, an accomplishment, but it also it was a, a very controversial kind of thing. Uh, we went from uh, um, about 27 schools in the county down to, I'm not sure, maybe 17 or 18. Someone said at the rate one of my critics, one of my many critics, I guess, said the rate that John Rice is closing schools down, said in five years we won't have any schools. They'll all be closed down. Um, we had, there was a little school called Laurel Grove, and it had two teachers. And uh, what happened in a case like that, in this particular case, you could not get the best teachers unless you forced them to go to those kind of schools, usually, or exceptions. And uh, I remember the two teachers that we had, I could give you the names now, but they, they always, they were, they were fighting all the time. Every few days they'd come in their cars, they'd come racing down to the superintendent's office to tell me one fighting with the other before the students and all like this. And um, I said, the next time this happens, no matter who's followed it, we're going to close the school down. So, to make a long story short, we did. But if you think of two uh, teachers, in, a, in a trying to teach all the different courses, <coughs> you can see how difficult it would <coughs> it would be. So th th they didn't want to move to uh, Lake City or Bryceville, and they uh, we had a meeting up there with the board members, and I went up and so forth, and they put nails, the roofing nails, all around, so we'd all get flat tires. And uh, the other uh, closed I uh, closed another school called. Uh, Frost Bottom, and there again, uh, people were waylaying and, and threatening to shoot and all this kind of, this kind of thing. So you're taking the heart of the community out, they said, and they had a point. But the, the children, when they went to high school from those little one and two room schools, they, they just had a terrible time, they dropped out, you know. So that was one of the things that we, we tried to do. And interestingly, after, after you did the consolidation, they were so much happier, none of them would have wanted to have gone back to those little uh, impoverished type of situations. Well, uh, the people in the Naris, in the town of Naris, and the people in the surrounding areas at one time were totally different. Everybody who lived here in the beginning almost uh, came from outside the region, uh, and everybody who lived out in the outlying areas were, had, were members of old families. But uh, by the time the, the annexation thing came about, a lot of the <coughs> residents in Norris were from the outside area, you know. So you had this <clears throat> amalgamation. But even so, when the annexation thing came up, uh, it became an unbelievably uh, bitter struggle on both sides. And there's no way to overemphasize <clears throat> the feeling. And um, so uh, without going into any of the details, I think there was uh, for the most part, good law-abiding citizens, I say for the most part, 95% on both sides. 
Then later on, when they started to bring this up again, several years later, uh, I tried to, to, uh, to talk with some of the people in NARS who were pushing it and trying to tell them what I thought would, uh, would develop. Now some misconstrued that as if this was my opinion, which it wasn't at all. But I hated to see the uh, communities split and divided, and, I, and my, all of my talk fell upon totally deaf ears. These were uh, a different group of people. And like Harry Truman once said, you know, you can't, people don't learn from history. Every group has got to learn for themselves. And uh, one of the wisest statements that uh, anybody's ever made, but they, nobody learned from that first time, and they sort of forgot about it and tried it again. And here again, uh, you had this animosity and the uh, accusations of trees being poisoned and, and the people outside the area were claiming the people in Norris poisoned them in order to shift blame on them and just an unbelievable bitter uh, type situation. And um, so that's all I'd say on that. John Rice, we would like to hear your thoughts about some of the more interesting people you've gotten to know and all your very positions. Who are some of the personalities that stand out? Well, in, you know, in connection with, uh, with uh, Norris and uh, the, the fact that, uh, that, that so many interesting people were, came here, and one was your father who came here to work for TVA in the 1930s, I think. And uh, he, his name was Will G. Lenore, and uh, he became one of the most, uh, to be redundant, influential influences. Is that good uh, grammar there? It'll pass. It'll pass. Uh, on, on me because I, uh, I don't really know. People are always saying, uh, why everybody that, that, that visits the Museum of Appalachia, and we have them from all over the world. Uh, yeah, uh, yesterday I had some people from Scotland, uh, Edinburgh, that planned to come over and film and do a documentary for her. And in about two or three weeks or three or four weeks, the German biggest uh, television station in Germany. I mentioned that just for a reason to get back to Mr. Lenore. <clears throat> and um, we've had the good fortune of being covered by Reader's Digest, a uh, long article in New York Times on several occasions, uh, National Geographic, Smithsonian, and, and uh, almost seldom does a week go by that we don't have an article in some national magazine, usually small, but uh, it's just amazing at the, uh, uh, how interested people are in our culture and so forth. So I attribute, uh, people are always saying when they come to visit, why did you start this? And uh, I got a call yesterday from a, a lady in California, in Berkeley, and uh, she's uh, coming here to do an interview with me on uh, um, the, uh, the early quilts and quilting and so forth. Everybody has a different subject they want to talk about. But uh, I have never come up with a good answer as to why I started this. Uh, first of all, I was interested in the people. Since I was a child, I've always been interested in older people. And I think I've been interested in, in everything, not just, not just things that are old. People make the mistake a lot of times thinking that because you're interested in one thing, you're not interested in everything else. Well, the people that I know that's been most interested in the museum, for example, uh, and some national folks, uh, I could mention several of them. Alex Haley is one, and uh, I remember Senator Mathias from Maryland was down not so long ago. Uh, Howard Baker, and I've been many times, and um, um, Senator Jennings Randolph from West Virginia. Uh, and all of those people want to know why you started. So I think a lot of it goes back to working with my grandfather uh, when I was young, and to bo all, both of my grandparents. But uh, having said that, um, when I was, uh, I guess when I was teaching here at Norris High School, I don't remember when and how I became acquainted with your, with your father. I guess it was because we probably met at some of these country auctions, and he was always there. We called him General. Uh, I don't know whether you knew this or not, but he was descended from General Lenore, I think, who founded Lenore City. Isn't that right? And uh, so we called him General most of the time. But I remember, uh, in one time in particular, being up there in the old house that he had, 
and all these great artifacts that he had and the histories behind them and the stories as to who they belonged to. And that to me was the most interesting, to, uh, to, to look at something uh, and see it intrinsically is one thing, but to look at it and know that this uh, particular item uh, belonged to uh, Sam Houston uh, and uh, the clock, one of the clocks that I have, for example, and he took it, uh, he had it out in Texas and moved it around and all the things connected with it. Or the items that, uh, one item I got from him uh, was an old barrel that belonged to an old lady by the name of um, uh, Faust, Granny Faust, who according to the newspaper was the oldest person in America, maybe the, uh, maybe the oldest woman ever to live uh, in the uh, United States of America. She lived about a mile from here. So to see that there are the things that belong to um, um, some of the other, uh, John Severe or whomever, uh, to, and I've got several things, for example, that belong to an old man by the name of General John Sollings, fascinating fella. The, the Guinness Book of World Record, the McWhorter brothers said he was the oldest man ever to live, the last survivor of the Civil War, and I had the good pleasure of knowing him. So I was in your dad's house, Mr. Lenore's house, and saw these things, and that really inspired me to, um, to not only um, appreciate them, but to start collecting more. I had been collecting a few things since I was a child, and um, so he and I, for many, many years, traveled the back traces of southern Appalachia and did things uh, as far as spending many hours uh, and laborious uh, trips that very few people would do. I remember one, just one example. We'd been, we left here before daylight one morning and we'd been out in Hancock County and different places and we decided, I decided maybe, one of us did, never had, we never had any disagreement at all except when I ran out of gas, he would say he would get on. He said, Rice, I told you, we we're going to run out of gas. Here we are in the middle of nowhere, 10 o'clock of the night. What are we going to do? So um, we, um, I could, that's a side story that I'll get into. But we were coming back after having been gone all this time and went over to see a fellow outside of uh, Greenville, outside of uh, Mossheim, by the name of Paul Welber. And he lived at the end of the road, and you had to drive and drive down this muddy road. It was cold and rainy. We got to the end of the road, and his uh, wife was milking, and uh, he sort of was glad to get an excuse to leave the milking with her and to uh, sell us some things he had. And we were had a lot of old tools and all kinds of things in the wheelbarrow, I remember, later in the night. Been gone for 12 hours or more. And getting cold and the ground was crusty on top, began to freeze. And we, though all those tools for some reason got dumped right in the middle of all this big mud pile and half of them disappeared, you know. And um, here we are down there, frozen hands, digging those things out, trying to clean them off, putting them in the car and so on. And I'm just thinking, you know, uh, I was superintendent of schools at the time, you know, but, uh, and he was, he didn't have to do this, he could retire, but, he had a great influence on uh, on me with regard to the collecting and with regard to everything else. He had a uh, he was an analytical type person for us wondering about things. You know, I remember one night you can cut all this out. You know, we were coming down the road from uh, in Hickory Valley, and uh, uh, I was having to brake once in a while. You know. And uh, for some reason, both of us thought about this at the same time. We'd both thought about it before, that if there's some way, instead of just putting on the brake and, and losing all that uh, energy, losing the motion, if that could be converted into something useful. For example, if you could, when you put the brakes on, if it started a generator of some sort to generate your electricity in the car, uh, then you took it off and you'd, you'd store that up in a battery kind of thing. So those are the kind of things that we would talk about, and, and some people, I guess, assume that both of us never thought about anything except going out and, and as some of uh, people would say, cheating these poor old people uh, out of their, uh, of their antiques and so forth, you know. But uh, we thought we were both fair, and I think that 
I've never, there's not a single person that could come and say that either one of us ever uh, treated them in a way. Uh, if you talk to people that we dealt with, they would all uh, say that. The people that, that were tended to be critical were people that had no idea what we bought and from whom we bought it. You know? My theory is, someone said one time, my philosophy was, how do I know what I think until I hear what I say? And sometimes after I hear what I say, I still don't know what I think, so.